Look, look, tell Pierre I'll be there. They got other things. Yeah, f hang on a sec. Just, I'll call him back. Yeah, yeah, look, Frankie, I'll, I've got to see Pierre first, but I'll, I'll be with you guys after that. And then, look, you know, just, just, I'll be there. I'll be, I'll be there. Look, Philippe, it's okay. Uh, I got to meet a couple guys first, but then I'll be meeting with you. That's cool, okay? October 26, 1940. You are Adolf Hitler. You have defeated and occupied seven nations in little more than a year. So you have power, yes? So everybody does what you want, right? Well, what if they don't? Maybe you don't have quite the total power that you think. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, the Italian War Council decided to invade Greece. Japan made an oil deal with the Dutch East Indies, German subs sank nearly 40 ships in the North Atlantic, and there were skirmishes along the Thai-Indochina border that may herald a real beginning of hostilities. Here's what follows. On the 24th, a secret agreement is signed between Britain and the United States. The US will equip and maintain 10 British divisions in time for a campaign in 1942. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill loves this. He also loves, when he's told the 26th, the British request for material to be bought from the US. 78 million rifle bullets, 78 million cartridges that would fit Thompson machine guns, and 250 airplane engines. Britain has plans to take the land war to Germany in 1942. Of course, even getting there by air has its problems. I talked a while ago about Britain's coastal radar, and now I'd like to say a few words about Germany's. I can thank Joe Gatt for pointing out in a comment that German radar is not so inferior as many sources would have us believe. Germany has what is called the Kamhuber Line, named after Colonel Joseph Kamhuber. This is a series of radar stations running from Denmark to central France. Each covers a zone of around 30 by 20 kilometers, but they have overlapping coverage since their Freya radar has a range of around 100 kilometers. Freya also uses a smaller wavelength than the British radar, like one-tenth the size. Consequently, it has a smaller antenna system, which can thus more easily and effectively be rotated and positioned. It has higher resolution, so it can detect smaller targets, but it is more complex, so it's harder to master and takes longer to build stations. Germany had but eight at the war's beginning, but Luftwaffe chief Hermann Goering has had many more built this year. Each zone of the Kamhuber line also has a main radar-directed searchlight and a few more searchlights in the area directed manually. They're also starting to back up the Freya radar with smaller range Würzburg gun-laying radar to pinpoint invaders once they've been more generally detected. Each zone has a main and a backup night fighter to deal with such invaders. A plane crossing the line would ideally be lit up by the master searchlight, then hopefully the manual ones would also follow suit, and the night fighter, or fighters, would intercept guided by radio. But there's still plenty of action over Britain. On the 21st, Liverpool is bombed for the 200th time. The next day, 180 Italian planes gather in Belgium. This is because on the 24th, the Corpo Aerei Italiano, the Italian Air Corps, established last month to support the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain, seized its first action. 18 Fiat VR-20s head for Harwich and Felixstowe. Three are lost in accidents. The GDA, the defense area covering the local ports, has only eight anti-aircraft guns by now. The others had been moved to guard RAF airfields over a month ago. The Italians are not just bombing the British Isles this week, though. On the 20th, they bombed Cairo and American-operated refineries in Bahrain. Italian leader Benito Mussolini, with his dreams of glory, new colonies, and great power status, has been worried about being sidelined in the face of all of Germany's quick and total victories earlier in the year. He thought that Britain was going to agree to peace terms, and if that happened, Germany could then dictate the whole shape of Europe. Mussolini was desperate to obtain the right to involvement in peace negotiations. He calculated that a few thousand Italian casualties would buy him that seat at the table. Hitler didn't have anything against Italy joining the war, not so far, but he has overestimated his allies' strength. Mussolini had famously boasted of 8 million bayonets when he had fewer than 1.7 million soldiers, and many of them lacked the rifle on which to place a bayonet. The country was desperately short of money, raw materials, and motor transport. To increase the number of divisions, Mussolini reduced them from three regiments to two, 
Out of 73 divisions, only 19 were equipped. In fact, Italy's forces were smaller and less well-armed than they had been on entering the First World War in 1915. We've seen that Italy is planning to invade Greece and soon. Now, Hitler had planned to leave Mediterranean affairs to Italy, but he learned after the fall of France that it's not that simple. Italy wants things, Vichy France wants things, Spain wants things. Often these are conflicting things. He has to balance all of that. For example, there's no sense provoking the forces loyal to Vichy in France's colonies by giving away some of them to Spain. But that might be necessary for Spanish help in order to deal with Gibraltar. It's far easier, though, to have Vichy France police itself until after the war, and then Hitler can give French colonies to whomever he likes. So this week, he's trying to sort this all out. Adolf Hitler meets Vichy Deputy Prime Minister Pierre Laval, the 22nd, at Montoire in the German-occupied part of France. Hitler wants Laval to pursue a more active policy against Britain. Laval says that, of course, he wants to defeat the nation that committed such offenses at Mers el Kabir and Dakar, but he also wants guarantees on the status of the Vichy government. Hitler avoids giving them. The next day, Hitler meets Spanish dictator Francisco Franco at Ande in southern France. Franco does not enter into an alliance with Germany, nor does he agree to allowing German troops to pass through Spain to attack Gibraltar. Hitler tells Franco such an attack could happen already January 10th, and then Spain could have Gibraltar. But many hours of discussion prove fruitless for Hitler. It is perplexing to many that Franco has failed to join the Reich cause, and Hitler presses for a positive move from the Spanish leader. Vague assurances and uncertain proposals are all that Hitler leaves with, and the Spanish dictator, tired of conflict and short on resources after the Civil War, will remain on the sidelines of the Great Conflict. Doing so would likely allow Gibraltar to remain in operation for Britain and would close the Spanish ports to both warring sides. Hitler finally tells Franco that Germany has won the war. The British are hanging on and hoping to be saved by the Soviets or Americans, but that couldn't happen for at least a year or two. The only threat from the British is possibly occupying some Atlantic islands or helping to cause trouble in the French colonies. This is why Hitler wants Franco to join his broad front against Britain. But for all that Franco may have ideologically in common with the Nazis, he cannot escape the fact that Spain's survival depends on imports, partly from Britain, sure, but heavily from the US, American oil and grain. Britain and America are also well aware of this, and also that Spain is not in good shape after the Civil War. So they have crucial economic leverage, and Germany cannot make up the difference in imports if Britain and the US pull out of Spain. That's why Franco has said before, as we saw, that he wanted Germany to actually invade Britain before he joined the Axis powers. He does not want to sabotage his supply chain. Of the long meeting with Franco, Hitler says to Mussolini he would rather have three or four teeth extracted than go through that again. On the 24th, Hitler meets with Vichy French Prime Minister Philippe Pétain. They also meet at Montoire, with Hitler angry about Franco denying him the means to attack Gibraltar. Martin Gilbert writes that Pétain is evasive this day about making a strong Vichy-German collaboration. He does not agree to enter the war against Britain, even though that would have gotten the return of at least some of 1.5 million French prisoners of war lost to Germany in the Battle of France. Nor does he agree to try and drive Charles de Gaulle and the Free French from French Equatorial Africa. See, Pétain wants France's colonies guaranteed. Hitler rejects this, saying that France started the war, so they have to pay for it materially and territorially. Hitler, despite his apparently limitless power after the defeat of France in 1940, proved incapable that October of persuading his debtor Franco, his vassal Pitan, or his ally Mussolini to support his strategy of a continental bloc against Britain. Actually, tomorrow, ooh, the future. October 27th, de Gaulle announces the formation of the Empire Defense Council for the Free French. Those French possessions that are loyal to Vichy will be asked to join. This is a broad appeal, a call to war, and will be known as the Brazzaville Declaration. There's more British news this week, actually. On the 26th, as the week ends, the 42,000-ton liner Empress of Britain is damaged by a bomb attack from a Focke-Wulf FW200 off the Irish coast. 
Two days from now, U-32 will finish the job and sink the ship. Now, that U-boat is under command of Hans Jenisch, submarine ace. However, it will be sunk the 30th by British destroyers, and he and 33 of his crew will be taken prisoner. He is the first submarine ace captured, and he and his men are interrogated. The interrogator's report, quoted in Martin Gilbert's The Second World War, reads in part, The prisoners were all fanatical Nazis and hated the British intensely, which had not been so evident in previous cases. They are advocates of unrestricted warfare and are prepared to condone all aggressive violence, cruelty, breaches of treaties, and other crimes as being necessary to the rise of the German race to the control of Europe. German successes thus far in the war appear to have established Hitler in their minds not merely as a god, but as their only god. And the week ends a week marked by Hitler's negotiations. Though apparently Franco, Pétain, and Laval, unlike the submarine crew, don't think of Hitler as a god. Neither does Winston Churchill. For this week on the 21st, in a speech to the French, he says, we seek to beat the life and soul out of Hitler and Hitlerism. That alone, that all the time, that to the end. He also says this, good night then sleep to gather strength for the morning. For the morning will come. Brightly will it shine on the brave and true, kindly on all who suffer for the cause, glorious upon the tombs of heroes. Thus will shine the dawn. Vive la France! If you'd like to know more about the Italian forces fighting for their fascist leader Benito Mussolini, you can check out our Between Two Wars episode about Italy's conquests in Northern Africa right here any second now. Our patron of the week is Bram Botts. Do like Bram and join the Time Ghost Army at patreon.com or directly at timeghost.tv. And also check out our Instagram on which we cover the war day by day. So ring that bell, subscribe, share, 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 and I'll see you next time. <laughs>